So hello everyone and welcome to Eco Questions. My name is Jenny and I'm the coordinator for the Metro Phoenix Eco Flora Project. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please remain muted uh, until it's time for our question and answer session, but you can type questions into the chat at any time and we'll address those during the Q&A. So everyone's gonna receive this recording in their email as long as you registered and it will be posted on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. For those of you not familiar with the Metro Phoenix Ecoflora, we're a community science project that documents urban biodiversity and we encourage the naturalist community through events like this one, resources and more. So each month we have a different eco quest and we look for specific species or relationships like pollinators and things like that. For the month of December, we decided to observe plants that have meaning to us, plants that we have relationships with and share our stories about them. So I'm going to place a link in the chat to our project if you'd like to learn more and also to our newsletter. If you don't do anything else with Ecoflora today, I really recommend signing up for our newsletter so you can stay up to date with events like this one. Uh, in coordination with the December EcoQuest, we have Chef Maria of Sana Sana Foods here with us today. So Maria is a Chicana born in Phoenix, Arizona, and her lineages stem from the Texcoco, Mexico, and Ratamuri people from Cuauhtémoc, Chihuahua. Maria's work is a restorative movement aimed at healing indigenous communities, assisting relatives in reversing diseases like diabetes and hypertension, healing our bodies from birth, using food as medicine, and paying tribute to her mommy, all while being in the kitchen with Sana Sana Foods. And she supports the community. Born in the Sonoran Desert, Maria has deep connections with plant relatives from the territory and has been working with local community groups to expand their knowledge of the territory and also ancestral traditional foods by providing community cooking classes, demos, and workshops. Maria is grateful for the teachings and trust she has received from elders, comrades, and relationships with indigenous peoples from around the globe. I feel like I've said it a hundred times already, but Maria, thank you for speaking with us today and welcome. And I'll let you share your screen and get started. Perfect. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, as mentioned, my name is Maria Parracano. So I just wanted to start off by first um, saying a few words in my language. Usually when we open up any type of community event, or even just our introduction, we like to share our language. So I just, just like to say, And so I was just saying thank you, asking the permission of my ancestry. And I also like to acknowledge, I also mentioned the our autumn relatives whose territory we reside in at this time being in Phoenix and those around us um, that have shared their traditional uh, uh, healing ways, food ways, water ways, um, plant, plant, plant ways. And so I just want to say, you know, my acknowledgments to the people of the territory and all the other migrants migrant communities that we have. Uh, as we know, Phoenix is our urban indigenous city, um, but made up of so many hundreds and hundreds of people. So I just want to acknowledge everybody's lineages, your ancestry, and um, and your each of your families as well. Um, so yeah, pretty much I'm Chef Maria Parracano with Sana Sana Foods. Um, you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, I am a mother of four. My oldest is eight. My youngest is three. I was born here in the neighborhoods of Garfield. I call it Barrio Garfield, but it's right um, downtown Phoenix. Uh, my family originally traveled here in the mid 80s or early 80s, I should say, um, from Mexico. Um, I have I'm one of nine siblings. My older siblings were all born in Mexico. I was the first of the last three children that were born here in the States. Um, but my family first arrived to this to Arizona as uh, visitors after being sponsored. Their visa was sponsored to travel here by a community of mariachis. So if you're familiar with mariachis, they're Mexican musicians. So the outfits that they wear that are very could be very, you know, ornamental, have lots of designs on them, different pieces of metal on the sides, if you're familiar at all. Um, my parents make those suits. So they actually, for the past 40 years, have been 
self-employed, uh, making these types of cultural attire, making ballet vale folklorico suits, which is like Mexican folk dancing outfits, um, and and anywhere from wedding dresses, quinceañeras, which is like a coming of age um, celebration for young women. So they'd made these type of attires very culturally based out of Mexico. Um, and so once we were here, they wanted them closer to, um, instead of traveling back and forth to the border. And so, that brought my family to through a group of mariachi organizers <laughs> they brought my family to arizona and we've been here ever since my mother actually um, who's pictured here in the black and white picture um she passed away unexpectedly in uh in 2014 but her teachings are what helped me what i call my restorative journey with not only food but connecting to the land and earth and and being able to share this with every everybody you know so i became actually i attended culinary school um in 2000 and i believe i started in 03 yes it was 03 where my parent both of my parents became diagnosed with diabetes and hypertension the same day and so that was foreign to us. We didn't know what diabetes was. We didn't know what hypertension was, right? So that, that was after 20 or so years of being in this country. Before that, you know, we, everything, every, there were so many of us at home. So every meal was an assembly line. Every trip to the grocery store was an experience. Every, every time we had stations as we grew up in the kitchen with my mom, I'm one of six daughters. So there was many of us in the kitchen, um, each having a role. I remember if you're from, if you've ever made chiles rellenos, which are like the stuffed poblano peppers that you could, some people could batter, deep fry. I like them just roasted and, and filled with, with veggies. Um, but uh, I was the, I would whisk, whip up the egg whites and so that was my job <laughs> and so growing up little by little everybody had grew up learning how to make something different um and so we were very fortunate to have that experience to where not until my undergrad um at asu i was out you know first time out of the house you know i felt it was a relief for me but then i'm like oh i gotta have to cook you know having now having roommates that was the first time I ever sat, saw canned tomato sauce. <laughs> and for me, that was in 2001, I believe. Um, and so my roommate was making rice, Mexican rice, you know, putting some tomato sauce in there. And I had to stop him. I was like, what are you doing? And he said, I'm making rice. And I said, That's not how you make it. You're supposed to boil the tomatoes, the onions, the garlic, put it in the blender, you know, make your sauce. And he's like, it comes in a can. <laughs> you know like the easiest thing and at that moment i was like i realized my own um that was my own um you know by my entitlement i guess you could say you know i was fortunate enough to grow up this way eating whole foods minimally processed foods um and then now as an adult i was i didn't know you know i didn't know that you could use how easy it is to use a can, you know, <laughs> and things like that. And so I guess that was, I was very fortunate that way, but not to say, you know, that you can't, which now I am the first one to buy, you know, if I don't have the time, I'm buying a can of tomato sauce, but <laughs> I'm doing every effort I can to be able to grow my food and use those foods in my, food, in my, in my dishes. Um, I grew up, like I mentioned, one of six females, daughters in my family. Um, we grew up anywhere from, we also had a Mex uh, ballet folklorico group or like a Mexican folk dancing group. So we grew up on the road a lot and traveling. Um, and so I think all of this led up to the pace of our lives at the time, um, finding it easier to just grab something fast food, you know, later on for my parents was a lot easier for them. And I think that's what led to ultimately their diabetes, um, their health issues, which were preventable through their diet and exercise and things like that, their lifestyle. So I feel like um, I've learned a lot now reflecting back on how my family's migration story came to be, how our healing and now how our healing journey has developed since the passing of my mom. 
um, at the time my mother passed away, she was vegan with, with me. Um, and she was able to, which is rare for a lot of folks um, when they're diabetic, if it's uncontrolled, um, she was able to be an organ donor as well in that during that time and helped four other people continue to live with the passing, which we knew she, was what she would have wanted because um, she wanted all her children to be able to, to benefit from, from her and her teachings and what she left us, right? So um, I always think of a lot of my work when it comes to whether it be supporting people in the community through birth support as a um, um, postpartum comadre, what I consider comadre um, in English, that's a co-parent or co-mother, um, which I like using that term versus the term, which most like most common term is doula. Um, but the term itself in Greek means slave or along those lines. And so for me, I'd rather be a co-parent in supporting somebody in their healing journey postpartum when it comes to either helping birth the child or helping support a birthing family, birthing parents heal from what they just experienced, right? That thin line between life and death, pretty much just similar as like plants go, you know, and once plants are harvested, there's that line, you know, of life and death. They will most likely, you know, once they're cut, they, they start dying in the process of dying, right? And so I see it very similar in our, our journeys as those who are able to give birth, those who um, whose bodies are able to offer themselves to, to so many people. Um, so 2013, or I'm sorry, 2003, I went to culinary school, I went to Scottsdale Culinary Institute. Um, I actually left ASU for, I took a break <laughs> and then went to culinary school. Um, and it took me three years uh, as I was working full-time for a nonprofit. I also um, have about 20 plus years now in the nonprofit area, helping as a leading social prevention and then social enterprise programs and helping build, you know, focusing on health disparities and education as well as um, immigration services. So broad, broad array of experience I had in the past, which has now also um, many years later, it led me to the creation of the Siwapakli Collective, which is now um, a group of community people, community families who have, like to support one another as any community, like a normal community, but like um, when it comes to birth support, teachings and sharing of traditional medicines. Um, I go back about 25 almost years of running in um, different communities or ceremonial circles here in Phoenix. So anywhere from, and I included a few pictures here of like Aztec dancing, um, Native American church, different ceremonies that we like to participate, that we participate in as a family. But now this also expands to a broader, an outer circle, broader of community, mainly women, but um, indigenous, self-identified urban indigenous women who are all aimed at healing the same aspects, healing what we say from womb to tomb and being able to help people birth, but then also transition. We have many who, uh, who are, student midwives. We have some who are um, death doulas as well, or death comadres, who are there to help facilitate, you know, in those, and as we all evolve in every, uh, you know, preparing for our time to transition. So that's kind of in a nutshell, a lot of my background, <laughs> but um, the most, the main focus for myself in attending culinary school was to be able to help my parents eat better and learn how to eat healthier for them. Um, fast forward to the birth of my first child, um, who is now eight. I became diabetic during my pregnancy. Um, and then l really learned at the time I was mainly vegetarian, mainly trying to focus right. While I was, I was in culinary school, I learned that French cuisine wasn't my food didn't work well for my body. I was used, you know, I hadn't been exposed to as many items as I was then like lactose or gluten, these heavy whipping creams and cheeses and butters and things like that. That's something that was foreign to me. And so I gained about 50 to 60 pounds in culinary school during that period as we had to, you know, you had to taste your food, make sure it's seasoned and things like that. 
So in that time, I was learning about different foods of the Americas, different foods from this continent, along with relearning a lot of my mother's foods, going back to asking the questions about how would we make this dish and how would you do this? And instead of this, can you use that, you know? And so it was really beautiful to see that I grew up with all this knowledge. You know, my mom carried all this knowledge and was able to share that with us, not telling us, you know, remember this, you know, like you'll remember this or you might remember this later type thing, or you know this flavor, you're, you're, you genetically know what about this food, right? And so I graduated culinary school. I was able to drop about 60 pounds. Luckily, I was able to drop that all, but all just focused on ancestral foods. Going back to those foods that my mom was able to share with me. And as well as technically, you know, going back and seeing like a chile relleno, it doesn't need to be fried. You know, like being able to try to adapt certain dishes to say um, not everything has to be, not all Mexican food is a burrito, you know, deep fried or wrapped in a tortilla in a flour tortilla you know like there's different options there's different things there's different dishes like here pictured is in the cazuela or in the clay pot is a mole and that mole is uses anywhere from 10 to 20 different ingredients based on depending which part which region of mexico you're from and each of those um ingredients adds a different flavor element to that mole which in our language means sauce. So anything that's a sauce is technically a mole in our Nahuatl language. Um, and mole is the Spanish influence that came later on upon colonization. And so my mole that I, I make um, is actually I make it with cactus, which is we'll touch on, on that in a bit here, and mushrooms, um, adding the healing elements of the mushrooms along with these being foods, ancestral foods that could be found throughout the continent. Um, as far as some more of my lineage, I just wanted to touch briefly on, you know, there's a picture of the, the, the pyramid of the sun from Teotihuacan. And so I do have some uh, teachings from elders down there as early as maybe in M March of 2020, I believe. Um, right before the pandemic kicked in, we traveled down to Teotihuacan, spent four days there um, with elders. And that's where they were pretty much telling us, you know, you need to, we were doing this work. I've been doing this work for the past 20 years, but very much inwardly, you know, being in the community, not sharing it a whole lot. Um, they gave us the permission pretty much saying, people need to know about what you do. People need to know and hear your messaging and things like that. So I was very fortunate to, you know, been giving that blessing for my elders to say, share this information, obviously, respectfully in the best way. Um, but we, with the efforts to try to help people heal, whether that be from emotionally, uh, mentally, physically, um, there's just a lot combined. And we don't think of how food or even the earth, how being outside, how connecting with the dirt and the land actually helps us mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you know, right? Seeing life in a holistic, as a holistic being, but how we belong to the earth and having a different perspective of life of seeing how we don't make, we might take of the earth, but we also give back, you know, planting more, making offerings of more, you know, whether it be using tobacco or different elements that we use in our, in our ceremonial lives, you know, when every time you try to, you take from, from, from the, from the land is we offer a prayer. We offer, um, we give thanks to that element to be able to, however we're using it whether it's as a medicine or if we're consuming that as a food being able to say you know thank you thank you for sustaining me thank you for healing me thank you you know having a relationship with that herb with that plant with whatever you're using and so um i think for a lot of indigenous peoples this is the perspective and this is our connection and relationship with the earth and the land and seeing that she is our mother and seeing how can we continue to have um, not only protect her and conserve her from natural natural elements and the resources, but how can we be good stewards of the land and be able to contribute to the livelihood, not only of the soil, but of us as humans and, and everybody around us, right? So we could go to the, to the next slide. So one of the first, um, when I was thinking of the plants, 
is I've had so many stories associated with this beautiful, amazing, powerful plant of the shugoi, which is in the Atom language, gobernadora um, in Spanish, or the creosote plant um, in English, and also known as greasewood or chaparral. You know, there's so many names um, that describe this plant, but it's so powerful. Um, I always like to share a story about um, we were preparing for my second daughter's uh, her water blessing, or like what would in mainstream or um, Christian ways be seen as a baptism almost, you know. But in our in our way, we call it a water blessing. And so it was. She was uh, almost a year old. It was for her birthday, and um, we were putting up. We we're get preparing for a ceremony in my sister's at my sister's house and who was her her godmother you know and so we um i ended up tripping over a cinder block and i fell really hard and my big thumb on my toe was black right away like super bruised and one of the elders there said and we had a bunch we had um we had harvested creosote because my daughter's name her name is kisani teshkotli the teshkotli in our language is actually the creosote plant. So we had it around at the time because her name means the beauty that grows from the rocks. And this is the creosote that grows out of the rocks or the stone. And so um, we grabbed some, she said, somebody grab some, run inside and just make a tea, just boil a pot of tea really quick. You know, just the darker, the better. So I sat there with my foot elevated while everybody was doing stuff and they brought the pot, they let it cool off a bit. Um, and as soon as it was warm enough for my for myself to be able to put place my foot in the pot, um, I did that. I was I sat there for maybe, maybe 10, 20 minutes or so. The bruise completely went away. Like it helped increase the circulation. Um, it's such a powerful plant for topical, for curing things and cuts. It's traditionally used for some of, you know, as many of you might know, be aware already with the creos, the powers of the creosote plant, uh, but also being cautious if you ever try to ingest it, just be care cautious there because it is very, very powerful. In Mexico, we do use it as a, a detoxing tea, but very, very minimal. I mean, like one to two leaves, like that's the power of, of the creosote plant, but you know, I just like to share that from a medicinal place, the power of this herb, this plant, this beautiful bush that here is everywhere. We're very fortunate that it's everywhere around us. When it rains, that's what you smell, right? The, the water hitting the leaves of the, 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 the slippery leaves of the, of the creosote plant. And then how connected it is to my daughter, my family is, that's her name. And I didn't know until once she was born that this the creosote plant like it runs all the way down into where my family's from in Texcoco. So the Texcotli connects with her name and it's the lineage of this plant, not only here in Arizona or in Phoenix, but down in Texcoco, which is right next to Teotihuacan, if you're familiar with um, where the pyramids are pretty much in, in central Mexico. This is where my family is from. And so the, this plant connects back to the birthplace of my family. And so very, very special to us. We love it. We use it all the time. We have it around us. And then knowing that it's also part of, you know, honoring my mother. My daughter was born um, after my mom had passed away. And so honoring her with, with that name and, and connecting us back to our origins, connecting us back to Texcoco. And so um, the Texcotli is the beauty. And so that's that's her name. And that's this why I love this plant so much, significant on so many levels, I think. <laughs> Go to the next one. <clears throat> So another plant that we see around here often is the ocotillo, and um, I love seeing the blossoms, very great for bringing around those hummingbirds and pollinators around the gardens and around the home. Um, I really like to use this actually, uh, my same daughter actually, <laughs> Kisani de Um Now she's six and now probably about three years ago had to have a procedure to remove some calcified lymph nodes and in her neck. And we didn't know from one month, you know, a few days, she said, mom, I have a bump, you know, on my neck. And, um, 
and little by little within a month it had grown fairly large and we didn't know what this was right so we took her to the doctors i was having you know um they were doing what they had to do as far as finding out what was wrong taking a biopsy different all these things i also turned to my to my relatives and saying you know how can i increase her if it's her lymph nodes there's something i have to do with her lymph nodes you know and so Ocotillo blossoms are actually very great to help lymphatic circulation. So we made her a tincture that she would, she loved it. She would come, mom, where's my tincture? <laughs> and she would, she would ask me to give it to her along with massages to be able to massage in, um, under the armpits, around the neck. You know, we have lymph nodes all throughout our body. And so um, massaging, massaging, making sure we were, it was circulating and not getting stuck in that spot right and so um we were doing this and for a few months she ended up having to have them actually surgically removed because there were so many and they were calcifying really fast but i feel i feel like we did what we could in a sense as far as getting the circulation going in her body making sure it didn't stay there as as much as possible um but just the power of even the ocotillo blossoms as well as the ocotillo root that can be used. And we were using a lot. We, we ended up having some ocotillos out in our yard. And so we were trying to do what we can and try to use what we had around us, but then also just seeing how great they are for circulation all around. And so um, this is how we used it. I don't know if, uh, I'm sure there's other ways that it could be used, medicinal ways, um, but this is how, we connected with this plant. Um, it also could be used for, you know, my husband's a big fan of um, the natural fencing using the ocotillos as well. And so he wanted to have a whole big like garden of ocotillos so that we could eventually use it for that. And so uh, we've since moved to, to, uh, to Levine. And so it's a little different for us now, but we're trying to include as many desert plants around, around us as possible. It's so beautiful to see the green ocotillos, the colorful flowers, and and just they're beautiful. You know, it's kind of like the um, similar to the to the shugo or the the gobernadora, like we say, the beauty that grows from the rocks. You know, the ocotillo has that very that energy of very being really rough with the spines and everything. But you see the beauty of the greenery, you see the beauty of the flowers, and then the animals that come the pollinators that come afterwards to 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 help it you know support it and so it has that that balance and we always try to find in different things and and many things that we do the balance of energies the balance of the masculine and feminine like what we call it in our language the the ometeo, the, the ometeo which is the um the ome is to and then the tail is the is the spirit or the the energy so seeing the balance of everything and seeing this from a very um from an, an indigenous way you know indigenous mentality of seeing how everything we connect to everything spiritually emotionally and physically you know and so seeing that the energy of these herbs of these plants is means something to us we connect to it not only by using the plant and honoring the plant before harvesting, but also just saying, you know, this is part, we're in the same biodiversity in a sense, you know, where we complement each other. We need one another, you know. We can move to the next one. One of my favorites, and there's again, so many around here are the nopali, or nopali is the actual pad in Nahuatl. The nochtli is the, is the fruit where the tuna in Spanish, um, also known as prickly pear. And then there's also the scientific name, right? <laughs> so many different names for it. But I love this, this plant. I use it, consume it raw. I consume it as a beverage. I, you can make it as in a jam, in a salsa. The fruit itself is a very good, delicious beverage. You can use it. I actually, if you're um, ever tried making like a pico de gallo, I chop it up and throw it in there as well. I like making it, putting it in smoothies. Um, and then the actual pad or the, the leaf of the, of the nopal after it's been cleaned, um, I like consuming it raw. 
but then it's also you can cook it, boil it, prepare it, pickle it, um, and it preserves really, really well. Um, I love it pickled as well. I make it into a salad. And I also like adding the raw nopales into um, a smoothie with pineapple. That really adds, it's really good. It's almost like a salsa actually, because <laughs> I throw it in raw with, uh, my recipe is with pineapple, cucumber, um, cilantro, a sprig of cilantro and some spinach and throwing in the fresh uh, uh, nopal. And I had a friend of mine who, who I had made a few uh, jars. I like to make jar it, freeze it in a mason jar, and then it's really quick in the summer heat of Phoenix, right? Um, it thaws almost instantly. <laughs> so um, that's my quick go-to in the summer. Um, she took a drink and she just said, this reminds me of Mexico City. <laughs> like, this is what I would drink in Mexico City. It's like, yes, that's that's pretty much like, it's an old, re easy recipe, very simple. You could play with the ingredients. If you need a little bit more sweetness, I add pineapple only for the sweetness. If you need to add more, you could definitely add honey to that. You could add different fruits as well to supplement any, the sweetness you, pr you prefer. But um, a lot of my cooking, obviously um yes i'll repeat the ingredients so i use uh fresh nopales and now the great thing is you could actually find them now in most mexican grocery stores you find them raw and packaged i usually put about half a bag into my blender um if it's already chopped if not you could buy the pads clean it up do it yourself fairly easy so it's about the equivalent of depending on the size of your of the pad maybe about half of it um into the blender with maybe about half a cup of pineapple fresh pineapple um a sprig or i should say maybe about quarter cup of chopped cilantro um, a handful of spinach if you like to sweeten you could use honey or agave um, I also add in chia seeds as well, and then just with water and blend that up with ice, and that's your smoothie. Very, very refreshing. The pineapple adds the natural sweetness, um, but then you could also add more if you'd like. But you could do grilled nopales for tacos. You could. I just love the the the, the versatility of the nopal. Right. It's very often compared to okra. If if you've never had nopales, it's very, most of the time I've had a lot of folks compare, compare it to okra because of the, in Spanish, we call it babas. In English, it's like the mucus that secretes from the pad once you cut it or warm it. Um, but that's the medicine in the plant. So you don't necessarily want to get rid of it because that's the medicinal properties of the plant, helping bring that fiber to your diet, but also helping you know, nopales are great are balancing blood sugars if you're if you're pre diabetic or diabetic and you want to um, help stabilize your blood sugar. Add more nopales to your diet and that'll help uh, balance that out for you. Next slide please. Similar to nopales, but you know the the siolim or the choya buds um, is another favorite of mine. Um, the buds themselves, um, here pictured, you have the, you have the larger ones that are flowering already blossoming, but then you have the smaller ones. And those are the ones that traditionally you would try to harvest, um, in season when it's season for it. Um, and there's very, it's hard, they're harvested traditionally the way, you know, a lot of our Atom relatives, uh, do this all throughout the city. When you, it's harvest time, you you know, like it's like word on the street type thing amongst indigenous folks here. It's like it's time to harvest. Let's you know, let's do it. Um, this year we did not harvest as much because of the dry of um, the dryness of the previous year and lack of monsoon and rains at the time. And so we want to be just be cautious and and listening to the earth. You know, if they need to rest, they need to rest. If we can harvest, great. If not, let's wait till next year and let's see what happens as far as rain and water around us, right? As water being one of the main, 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 obviously we're all here in the valley. Um, we need water, you know, the, so does the earth, so does the, so do the plants to be able to sustain us. And so we want to make sure that we only harvest things when it's okay for the, for the plant 
to give of itself, right? We don't want to ever try to take more than we need to. We want to make sure that the plants continue to live and continue, continue to flourish and feed us later on. So the Toya buds, I love including them when, when possible. I actually add them just to a pot of beans, pinto beans, if you ever, if they could be black beans, tepary beans, anything you, you, any type of bean you like, I throw them in dry and I let them just cook with the beans. Um, add in some onion, some garlic, and I don't season the beans until after they're cooked. So you don't ever wanna add salt to a pot of beans because it will not cook. <laughs> so you, the, the sodium in salt coats the bean and it doesn't allow it to open or to cook through. So you wanna make sure that if you ever make a pot of beans, you don't season it till the very end. Um, and the choya buds adds a great flavor to the beans along with um, more fiber. You know, you're adding more nopales. It is a type of cacti. So you're adding more fiber to the beans at flavor. And just think, you know, you could add, I love making, um, I call it my desert soup. And this, some of these recipes are also on my website at sanasanafoods.com. Um, but I love adding them on, mixing them in with um, corn. At, once it's cooked and it's hot, the pot's still hot. Beans are cooked. The choya buds are cooked. I throw in um, spinach, cilantro. I add in a jalapeno. I throw in uh, a, some corn kernels and then let it just, uh, and zucchini, chopped zucchini or squash. I throw that in and then just let the residual heat of the pot cook those because you don't want to overcook them because they're, they're vegetables are delicate, right? So add flavor and seasoning to it. And I just have a one pot meal. There you go. But with the base being beans. And so fairly simple, I think. I always think of making a pot of beans as a revolutionary act because you could always go buy them. <laughs> It's always a, uh, out of convenience, right? But uh, my kids love beans. I'm so glad that they love beans, um, different kinds. And we make all sorts of different dishes with them. You know, it's just the, the base of a meal. And then you could add to that. The next slide, please. One of our other favorites, and we see this tree everywhere, it grows here everywhere are the mesquite pechitas or the mesquite trees, the velvet mesquite that gives its pods. And this is this these, these are the, the pods that it could be harvested. Um, I've actually made tortillas with mesquite flour. I know other people have tried, you know, made many bake. I don't bake much, so <laughs> I give props to people who do. <laughs> but, um, you know, they bake using mesquite flour. It does have a very distinct taste. So if you've ever tried mesquite, uh, flour yourself or or the pods even the pods are edible um, but usually when the flour you're you're when you grind your own or you're trying to grind your own flour you're grinding the whole pod along with the seed and that is actually what makes the color the light like little light uh, um, off-white color um, that's where the that's where it comes from so anywhere usually we try to when at harvest time we try to uh, be cautious because once the pod falls to the ground, like you can't just grab it off the ground because most likely insects have gotten to them, which is another type of protein. But <laughs> if you don't want to use those, you want to try to harvest right off the tree. So what we try to do is we place the sheet and shake the tree as when it's when it's ready and full before they drop to the ground, you know, and then you're able to use them for different things, mainly flour. And the flour itself is really great for if you have diabetes, it helps, um, it's a low glycemic food. So it actually helps lower your blood sugar as well. So little by little, you could, even if you'd like to make a tea using them, you could grind them down into a flour. Um, and so that, and it's a very, I would balance it out with something sweet probably, or something naturally sweetened, just because the mesquite flavor is very, could be very strong. So it is a very distinct flavor. All right, and they grow very well. They, they um, once the seeds drop, they'll probably, another tree will pop up right away. So they grow very, very well here in the desert. Next slide. Oh. 
And then my favorites, I had to include a picture of my my three of my three girls. Um, we had a son, but he did not survive, and so I just want to acknowledge him as well. Um, but these are my three, the three sisters, I like to say, <laughs> the three sisters. And if you're familiar with the three sisters of indigenous foodways, it's the corn, the, the squash and the beans. And so I refer to my daughters as the three sisters because that's what my kiddos that are left. Um, and then the fourth one that in my tradition is something we use a lot um, and very significant for our people is the amaranth. And so this is a picture of my, my youngest in the field, an amaranth field here in South Phoenix that we were able to grow and harvest from. And so um, early morning, she wasn't in the best mood when I took this picture, <laughs> but, um, but she loves it actually. She loves eating amaranth. I pop it for them. So that at some time at, um, early on when I started introducing these ancient grains, such as, such as quinoa and, and amaranth, um, I would introduce it to them popped. I would pop it, the grain itself on the stove top. Um, and so to them, it just becomes really light and fluffy. And so they're like, she, she was so small at the time. She's three right now. So she was a lot younger. I think barely eating, being able to like sit up and eat some solids. And I was giving her amaranth as a, in a form of porridge. Um, how do you harvest the amaranth? That's a good question. So amaranth, as the, you see the tall, this is a purple amaranth that we planted. And so each little flower gives a seed and that's the actual edible part. Actually, the whole plant is edible. You could eat the whole plant, um, but the seed itself, you would, um, what we did is we set blank uh, sheets or blankets out and then you would smack them down to release the seed and so i really like to include my kids as much as possible in this in when we harvest plants and try to um and for seed collection because i feel like it's so important for our kids to understand the importance of growing our own foods mm -hmm. and harvesting and preparing them because it's easy to go buy a tortilla but they don't know the significance of it culturally spiritually, you know, for our families, um, the significance of it, if they don't, if they've never made it, you know, and so I feel like that's what my mom was trying to do with us, you know, making sure we have this knowledge, make sure we know how to do it, not directly saying these words, right, <laughs> and saying like, oh, you'll thank me later, you know, type of thing, <laughs> but I feel, you know, if you've never grown your own corn, if you've never gone through the nixtamalization process, if you've never had to grind it to make tortillas or tamales, then it's just a regular tamal. And I feel like the connection with the food isn't there, right? We wanna make sure that we have a connection to what we consume. That way we can honor it, but that way we're honoring our bodies as well. Like making sure that what we're putting into our bodies serves a purpose versus just consumption to you know, for to eliminate hunger. And that's where you have a lot of these filler foods that come into, you know, society, <laughs> junk food, fast food, processed foods, you know, but then you have others that, you know, you could look at and think of how is this going to help my body? How can this heal my body? How can I use this food as medicine? And that has been such a big thing for me the past 20 years to be able to think and see you know, this treat food as my medicine, whether that be a tea, a beverage, you know, a smoothie, um, a soup, you know, a salad, just trying to see how can this help my body versus knowing that if I consume, if I have to, well, obviously not to knock anybody, but I know sometimes time is of the essence, right? We have to do what we have to do, you know? But if we're able to set that time aside to plan, then I want to make sure I don't feel crappy after I eat something, right? If you have a uh, an allergy like lactose or gluten, you're not going to want to eat something with glucose with lactose or gluten because you know your body's going to be affected. You're going to feel it. You're not going to feel good, right? And so, same thing. If I know my body doesn't doesn't work well with something, then I'm trying not to put that in my body. Because then later on, I'm trying to find enzymes or something to be able to help my body with process that, right? And that's actually what the nixtamalization, if you're familiar with it, the nixtamalization process is what helps 
partially break down or open up that kernel of corn that could then be absorbed into our body because otherwise it our body cannot break it down and you see that afterwards right <laughs> like corn just goes right through but if it's gone through the nixtamalization process it could be broken down and the nutrients are then absorbed into your body so i know there was a a question i believe what great source of nutrients for when you're little was one giving her amaranth yes amaranth i love it that's one of our ancestral first foods amaranth um, instead of like oatmeal or something you we would use amaranth along with avocado like soft foods that you're able to for them to be able to process and break down as well as adding this texture for them right and being able to to eat and use their hands and their eyes and everything so my little ones love avocados they love beans they love um they just i made their their food you know so very fortunate to have been able to be home with them as well um early on you know so um but thank you. I just love sharing about food, obviously, but then all my stories that are linked up to my own healing journey, being able to reverse my diabetes through food, reverse my hypertension. And at the time I also had, which I didn't know in between my third and fourth pregnancy, that I actually had stage four liver disease. And I didn't know until after I went to the specialist and they're like, why are you here? <laughs> you know, I, I, they took me off of, um, through my diet, I was able to um, get take uh, eliminate diabetes medication, hypertension, and uh, and the liver disease was gone. So being able to say that ancestral foods truly save have saved me, and being able to share this with everybody is now my my purpose to be able to say how can we help other people? You know, my husband um, immediately after my my three month postpartum appointment with my daughter, which for the first month, I was actually bedridden, um, placed on a medication for postpartum preeclampsia, um, where I, if I got, if I sat up, I was at risk of a heart attack stroke or seizure. Like that's how heavy it was um, after having a very traumatic birth, my last birth. Um, and so at the time I asked the women of the collective or the Siwapakli collective to help prepare foods for me. Some helped my husband, some helped care for the children, some helped clean the house, like all this stuff, which this is why for me, it's such, it's so important to also help support other people because we don't have, we don't function in, in, as this type of community anymore, you know? And so for me, it was really important to give that back because they were able to be there to support me and my family. Um, and that really allowed my body to do what we needed to do. They actually prepared plant-based ancestral food meals for me the whole time. And so I was able, I would tell them, make this and make that and make this tea for me and do this. And I was very fortunate that they were able to be there and help support me in that way. And now, you know, I'm trying to do the same thing for others through the Siwa Bakli Collective, through regenerative education with um, the creation of our food forest in South Phoenix, through Sana Sana Foods and doing what I can, whether it be child with uh, child education to elderly education to diabetes education, you know, trying to help folks um, learn from what I went through and trying to make sure that we have healthy communities, whether that's through connecting with the plants and the earth, um, our mental health that has, suff has suffered a lot, especially during this pandemic, um, but that our children, our little ones grow up in a better world. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, we've got a couple other uh, comments in the chat. Uh, Becky said, we planted our first three sisters garden this monsoon season and are still harvesting beans from it. Uh, we also have Lori said, involving children in the food preparation not only teaches them about food, but also gives them a feeling of value, productivity, and importance within the family and community. Uh, we also have a, a thank you, wonderful presentation and personal story. Thank you for sharing. Uh, feel free, everybody, to type questions in the chat. Um, and I'm going to ask a verbal, a couple of verbal ones really quick. And uh, actually, we just had one come in. So do creosote, acatillo, and other floral plants dry, preserve well, and retain nutrients to be used at a later time? That's a good question. You could definitely dry them. And then once they're rehydrated, the same thing. They, they do hold, contain, contain their nutrients. The only thing that would eliminate the nutrients and actually kill them off more is if you heat them. So anytime you, like say, even for a vegetable, you overcook it. Or like say you 
let me see, I'm trying to think. Okay, like a squash. Say it's an Italian green squash. You overcook it, it loses the color. You wanna maintain the green because that is the nutritional, the nutritional values in the skin of the, of the squash. So as long as you keep the color there, then you keep the nutrients. If you kill it through the heating process, then it's hard. So I think for like herbs, it's the same thing. You wanna do a dry, um, either you hang them, you preserve them, dry them outside, uh, inside I should say, well preserved. <clears throat> you use a dehydrator, which also helps, but very limited time. Cause you wanna make sure that they, you don't eliminate the, nutri the nutritional content of those, of those herbs. Um, the other thing that's very, which I like to make are tinctures or, um, uh, flower essences. So you can make similar things using all these herbs. Thank you. So like I was saying, everyone, please feel free to type in the chat. Oh, there we go. We've got another one. Do you have <laughs> suggestions for oil infusions method and oil types? Yeah, since I, I use a lot of oils to make salves and, and you know, um, like that, but I usually try using the old mason jar and storing it for a while method. <laughs> I just, I use grapeseed oil. I like using grapeseed. Um, okay, salt so tea is just two into it. Yes, just two, two leaves and that's it. Uh, but let me, I'll, I'll touch more on that right now in a bit. But for the oil, I like using uh, mason jars and I'll, I'll put the dry herbs inside and then I just fill it, cover it in a paper bag and then just put it somewhere away from the sun and just let it sit there for about a week. And that's the, I make it with cinnamon. I make, I use them as massage oils. So I'll do cinnamon. I'll use whatever herbs I have in the pantry. I'll use them and then use them later for massaging or for, or for salves. And then the other question was about the creosote leaves. Yes, the, I would I would definitely be cautious. Just you know, be careful if you're using creosote as a tea. It is great for detoxing, but it's very powerful. So I've actually just seen two leaves used. Like just make let the warm bring the water to a boil, turn off turn off the heat, drop in two leaves, and then let it cool. And that's about all the creosote you would need because it's very very strong, and you'll feel it. So. If you're, if you're curious about using it as a tea, just like I said, be cautious. Um, if you need it a little stronger then okay, but I think it goes, a little goes a really long way. Maria, is that, as far as amount of water, is that like a couple of quarts in a pot? I would say for two leaves, you would want to do like four quarts. It's very, very strong. <laughs> The follow-up question, uh, how often would one drink it if it's very powerful? So how often? You know, I've had a few people tell me that they do it once a month. Um, and then just if, you know, depending on your body and how your body reacts to it, um, in our lineage, it, people would do it often. Like it was just part of what we did, you know? And so for me, I just, because it's so powerful and I've seen what it does, even just topically, I'm just cautious of putting that in my body. <laughs> because it is powerful you know like I've done it I do it as a spray like I've made it instead of drinking it I'll put it into a spray and kind of um I know some people call it like an aura spray or like a smudge spray I just put it in a spray a glass spray and amber bottle and just use it like as a refresher for me I said, and the steep time is about the same as other teas. So a couple of minutes. Yeah. As long as it's cool, you know, it's, it, it cools enough for you to consume it, then you're fine. It doesn't need to be in long at all. And don't worry about the questions. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> you take the leaves out at that point, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And we have another with creosote. Would you use the dried leaves flower branch for an oil infusion? Yeah, you could definitely actually the fresher the better just because that's what the 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 medicinal properties are the on the leaf. But you could also use it dry. I've used it for um, like for oil infusions. I've used it dry as well. Um, at that point when it's dry, I actually use a little bit of heat just to allow the plant to release some of the medicinal properties because the oil, the heat helps release the the oils. So fresh is better for oil infusion with creosote. It would be stronger that way. Yeah. Dry, it, it has the same effect, 
you just have to warm it to get release the medicine. Yeah. So while we're, uh, you know, talking about using all these plants and the relationships we have with them, there's been, you know, an increase in foraging and wild crafting lately, uh, I think, especially among non-Indigenous folks. Um, and you talked about working with plants from your yard um, and being respectful, you know, of how much we take and when, and I think that gets overlooked. Um, so for people interested in working with plant foods and medicine, what kind of guidance would you give about getting started and, and making sure that we're being respectful about it? Yes, definitely. I would, I would look into starting off at whether you, where you source them uh, first, if you're, if you're starting from seed um, or if you're, or if you're going out to harvest, you know, I would just be cautious about where you're doing this uh, as well as, you know, here things grow so well. And I just want to say for like creosote specifically, they don't transplant well. So if you're trying to do like go buy one, it's going to be hard to keep it alive. <laughs> so um, because they grow, they're so, they're, they usually, and when you plant it, it's called the gobernadora in Spanish for a reason. It kills off anything around it. Um, and so you want to make sure that it's in an area away from anything else. You don't want to plant something next to it because it's going to die. <laughs> um, but um, the, the governance, the, the gobernadora as being the true controller. And for a lot of autumn relatives here in, the, in Arizona, it's part of their creation story. So being using the creosote plant is very it's very touchy for non-indigenous folks because this is part of their lineage. It's an expansion of the culture. It's an expansion of their of their life, you know, their being. And so I would just be cautious with that. A lot of folks who know of its medicinal properties but don't necessarily have a relation to people, you know, place. Thinking of place, physical place, is important. A lot of us don't have our are, are displaced or don't have a relationship with people here of this territory. So I would just think about that, you know, think about your relationship, not other than your yard, <laughs> you know, how is your relationship with other people in the area? Um, sometimes you could have friends gift them to you, you know, just depends on, on how you source it. Like I said, if you start from seed, you could easily go out, respectfully harvest seeds of the creosote, you know. Um, that way you don't, you don't harm the plant itself. Um, and then other things like say, uh, even rosemary, which is such a powerful plant as well. Rosemary, um, you know, it's easy to do a quick harvest somewhere, put it in water, you know, try it grows. It's easily more easily accept, uh, accessible, I should say. Um, but just think about where it came from. So it's really important to learn of where am I sourcing the seeds from? Where am I sourcing the plant from? Um, if it's a small farm, how can I support that? Like, that's my mentality is like, how can I support the people growing the food, growing the plants? Because I know the work it takes to do it. You know, a lot of people like, again, going back into the relation, the topic of relationship with food, relationship with what we use. Be, through colonization, industrialization, and all this other stuff, we commercialization, you know, like, you don't have those relationships with things anymore. So it's very much thinking, how can I, how can I help the person and sometimes it's paying more for things? Yes, you know, but that's because you're eliminating all the hands in between. And you're going directly to the source to be able to support them. Um, I think most of us here in this space have that mentality, you know, of trying to think of how can I reduce harm to the planet, <laughs> you know, and trying to, and, and, and either working with plants or gaining knowledge and education about plants. I think go back to try to, as much as you can, to the source, you know, if it's an indigenous community, indigenous farmer, indigenous, you know, group doing things around education, support that and then see how you could learn more about it, how you could uh, learn more about the plant or, um, and then meet so many people who are doing doing amazing work around seed preservation, um, nurseries, you know, all around that are people growing their own plants and very special plants, heirloom plants that a lot of people don't have access to. So um, a lot of it is research <laughs> and relationship building. And um, yeah, that's pretty much my, my recommendation. That was my next uh, tie in was how can, you know, we better support your work and, you know, local community and, and things and you know, I think what you said about those connections, you know, it's not just taking, 
So we're reducing harm, we're making connections and building relationships. It's not just, I'm going to take, you know, eight bundles of creosote for myself that I'm going to sell at the farmer's market. It's, you know, that meaning. Definitely, definitely. And there'll be a few that know what that bundle represents, you know? And I think that's where you find that disconnect with folks of like, oh, I'll pay, you know, X amount of dollars for it, but I don't know how to use it. You know, just because of what it is, you have some who will pay X amount of dollars because they know how to use it and know what its significance is, right? Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, there's so many people doing a lot of amazing work right now, trying to in this regenerative movement, not only through food and plant medicine, but you know, um, I mentioned the food forest. We actually have a volunteer day this Saturday out at Spaces. We got about 70 cubic yards of compost to spread out across an acre. So we're definitely open to volunteers uh, this weekend at starting at 8 a.m. out at Spaces of Opportunity. Um, so we'll be there at the farm. Um, but then we also do a lot of education work through Sana Sana, through the Siwapakli Collective. We also provide uh, virtual wellness workshop series, whether that be for medicine making to myself in the kitchen and different topics from mental health support to birthing family support, you know, different topics we have there. So it's definitely, I know, uh, Jenny, you're going to be sharing a few links for us, but um, I have a little bit of everything. So, <laughs> but definitely open for anybody who has any questions uh, around food, indigenous food ways. Um, I also have a, a coloring book on my website. If you like to have kiddos, um, I loved creating that with my daughter um, who's, illustrated in the coloring book as well and has her own recipe for tortillas in there using blue corn um and I actually a few years ago now maybe about four or five years ago I did a class at the um, Phoenix Art Museum and she taught it and she was about five That's amazing <laughs> so we created the coloring book for for uh to honor children you know in our lives and so hopefully you could access that to free digital download and you could enjoy coloring that <laughs> I like coloring. <laughs> so we do that. I did place links in the chat uh, for the various efforts that Maria is a part of and supports and works in, and also social media handles. So you can follow on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we also have a comment in the chat. Spaces of Opportunity is an incredible place. Yes, it is. And I'll be sure to share that volunteer information when I send out the email with the recording. So if y'all are interested in that, it'll be there. Um, I'm going to put my uh, email in the chat. If you have uh, questions about anything, please feel free to reach out. Um, and also our uh, social handle for Ecoflora, so you can stay up to date with all kinds of things. Does anybody have any last minute questions? You're welcome to unmute and ask verbally if you want while I'm throwing these links in the chat. I'll do one more. What's your favorite plant? One of your favorite plants, maybe not just for cooking, but or medicine. Mm, that's a good one. That's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, very one hard. Like five. <laughs> mm. What's my favorite? I just have to say nopales. You could use them in so many different ways. Um, there's so many different kinds too um, that you could consume or just decorative or just use for medicine. You know, there's so many things. So nopales, I think, are my favorite. <laughs> I, think that's I have them tattooed actually. <laughs> absolutely wonderful wonderful plant uh so we got another comment thank you all so much and making this possible and for sharing this knowledge have a wonderful evening thank you so much love this program uh so like i said i've put our event right in the chat as well for future events like this maria thank you so much you've been an absolute joy thank you for sharing thank you for you know giving us this knowledge it's so appreciated well thank you for having me i really enjoyed it you know, everyone, thank you so much. We'll see you next time.